Thank you. Thank you. I'm very touched that I'm able to be here to thank you in person and to look at each one of your faces and to acknowledge the work you do. You all, you, in your unique ways, make a big difference in people's lives and their families' lives of people with chest diseases. You see, I lost two of my dearest people in the world to chest diseases. My grandfather, who named me my Chinese name, who in many ways saved my life, died of emphysema when he was in the 60s. I was seven years old. And my beloved husband died of coronary thrombosis when he was out mountain biking in his 40s. I was in my 30s. You came too late to save them, but you are making a tremendous difference in so many people's lives and allowing them to truly contribute to the world, their highest potential, and also, more importantly, to be able to share and be there and with them and their loved ones for more, so much longer. So for that, I really thank you. So do it for me. Turn to the person next to you and just say thank you. Thank you for making a difference in the world and in people's lives. Give them a handshake, even give them a hug. <laughs> that felt good for me. <laughs> Thank you. I thought about how I would present driving diversity and the importance of that to you, who I found out is already a very amazing diverse group. I thought about your background. You are all experts in science, in anatomy, in pathology, and everything to do with the human body and the intricacies of that. You know about numbers, you know about statistics, and I do too, having to report to Wall Street for many years every quarter. Numbers mean something, statistics mean something. But what I found in everything I've done, and you might have found this too, the most important way that I have made decisions that have really impacted me is when I listen to my heart. And so today, yes, I'll give you some numbers, but what I really want us to talk about in some ways is what really does our heart tell us? What really feels right? And that is, in a way, what we're talking about. The topic today, of course, is about driving diversity, why it's important. But I want to put a personal face onto the topic and Understand, and as I saw even the presentation just now, you had a lot of diversity in the group. This, this group is walking its talk already. I want to talk about how to manage in a multicultural environment. This group is global. I gather about 30% of you are from a different country than the United States, so already you have that. So how do we manage as the group gets more and more diverse? How do we manage as medicine gets more and more diverse in how we are achieving technology changes and all the different advances while not forgetting what truly brings medicine to, to being important, that is the human connection. And then to provide you with some principles and tools to help you as you move forward. And of course, this group can learn and share from each other. And most important, we're gonna have fun in the process. So, it's all about you and your expectations because when we find out what we expect is usually what we find. So, and we're gonna talk about that to begin with because you can find out a lot about me during the course, so I'm gonna start by asking something about you. How many of you are first, second, or third generation in the location you're living in, which could be the county, the state, or the country? So, could you raise your hand if you are? I would say probably about 40% of you are not from that particular location for more than three generations. So already you're bringing with you a certain degree of mindset, a certain cultural background that is different from the, the location you're living in. And that is very true for the community we're living in at large, wherever we live. 
How many of you speak or hear a different language at home than the, the common language in the outside of the home? 20, 30%? How many of you celebrate another harvest festival other than the fourth, Thanksgiving, fourth Thursday of November? I celebrate, for example, Thanksgiving and Mid-Autumn Festival. How many of you celebrate another new year other than January 1st? Why am I asking you to ask this question? It's because a lot of what, of what we share as a community, we have a different level of thinking and cultural background that we're caring about that we may not even think about, and that really colors our perspective. We may not even realize that, but that is changing and adding a little flavor in our perspective in how we approach everything. And if we bring that together, truly what we get is what we used to call in America a melting pot. I found a new word which is much better than melting pot because melting pot seems like that we all merge into this gray blob. We're not going to be a gray blob. We're actually going to be a mosaic. Each person shining brightly as a unique light, but all together making so much more. Isn't that what we get together? Is when we bring our unique selves together and together create something much more meaningful. And that's what we're getting because the world is moving and changing very quick. Give you a few numbers of now and then. 2011 census, there were more black, Hispanic, and other ethnic newborns and then white mirrors in America. This is the first year that the minority is becoming the majority. In 1973, 78% of, the, of their students in schools were white. In 2010, the most recent statistics, 50% of them were white. And if you remember the prior statistics, in a few years, about five or six, the minority is going to be majority. So in our country, this country, the United States, being able to focus on minorities as being something that we have to embrace and integrate is not an option anymore. If we are going to grow and change and innovate with the times to survive and thrive, this is a must. The composition of U.S. population, 2011, minorities 124 million, females 158, males 153. What does that mean? 56.6% of the population is already, if we count a third of the females as being diverse so we don't double count, is part of diversity. And the swelling of the population of Asian and Hispanics went 40% versus 1.5% increase in non-Hispanic white in the same time period. The composition of the country is changing. And then the same goes to the composition of the world. If you look at the small circle, you see that 30% of the population used to be in 1950 in the developed nations. The developed nations, by definition at the time, were primarily the white race. Now, in two, what projection in 2050, the developed nations is only going to represent about 11% of the population. The growth is coming from all the other nations. Our, our world is changing, the demographics are changing, and we have to embrace and change with it or else we're going to be changing for the negative. Another way to look at it is looking at the aging population. If you look at the population between 1980, 2010, and what was projected 2040, these are talking about the people age 65 and over. If you look at the developed regions, 25% of them 
are going to be over 65. And if you look at the less developed nations, significantly less percentage. The demographics of the world is changing. The aging population is changing. So to embrace diversity is not even an option at all. This is the reality we have because the world is not the one that we grew up with. So what does that mean? These are all numbers, but how does it bring back to our heart that we talk about? So I'm going to start by telling you a little story, a story about my life, how I came to be standing in front of you and talking growing up. I'm the little girl with a giant bow in her hair there. I was born in Hong Kong, second daughter in a very traditional Chinese family. My birth was followed very quickly by the birth of three younger brothers. If you know anything about Chinese families, this is not a very desirable position to have. In fact, we in marketing would call that very poor positioning. By the time I was seven years old, my parents decided that there was a way to move me out of the family to live with my aunt and uncle in the country because they didn't have any children and maybe they would take me on. So I moved to the fishing village, Taipo, to live with my aunt and uncle. It was actually not that bad aside from being shunted off and rejected by the family, which of course is devastating. But at least nobody was telling me I was worthless anymore and nobody was beating me. But I did learn something that now we call child labor. There was no such term at the time. And it was something that gave me meaning in life. At least I was doing something. But I want to go back to my grandfather that I mentioned to you early, who gave me my name. He gave me a name that was very unusual for a Chinese girl. It's the name of two of the emperors in China, Hei Li, known for one known for his wisdom and compassion and peacetime, and one known for his strategy and prowess in wartime, usually gifting the firstborn son of a very prominent family. I don't know why my grandfather gave me that name, but with that name, that gave me the understanding that maybe somebody believed in me, maybe somebody thought I was worth something, and that kept me going throughout the, my my rather tough childhood. And that's the same thing we can do for, you, for other people. We don't know when we reach out to somebody how we can make a difference in people's lives and the impact we make. So I lived with my aunt and uncle for some years doing child labor. But it wasn't so bad until at age 11, my aunt got pregnant and she had her first child and it was a boy. So I got shipped back to my family again. And um, what, I, what did I learn in this process? I learned that hard work pays. Don't question authority. And there's up a limit and how much a person can rise in life. Now, if I still believe those things, would I be talking to you? Probably <laughs> zero chance, right? But so, I want you to listen to your heart now and ask yourself, what did you learn as a young person that is no longer true? What did you learn that is now holding you back from achieving your high potential, your highest potential? And what is that in there that can help you open your heart to bring in more compassion and sharing of all that you have to with the world? As I said, I went back to Kowloon to live with my family, which isn't so bad because I found out there a classmate of mine, Rebecca, lived in this area. Her family all lived in a room, five of them. Father, mother, brother, sister, and Rebecca. They did not have enough to eat oftentimes. And the three of the children had to share two stools that they sat on to do homework on, the, on their bunk bed, I was filled with outrage. I couldn't understand why two working parents, working full time, could not afford to feed their family and give them a different way of life. 
why they had to share a bathroom and a kitchen with two more families. It didn't seem to make sense. It wasn't right. That gave me the impetus. That gave me, found, had me find my life purpose, which was to make a po positive difference in the world. I was going to change the life of people like Rebecca's. And I still remember that I was worthwhile because of the, my name. Even though my grandfather died when I was seven, I knew that there was something that I could do. So I came to America by myself halfway through high school. I entered college early, two suitcases and my teddy bear. And it was a shocking change because I encountered a completely different world. Environment-wise now, it looks beautiful. Open space, blue skies, cold weather. <laughs> For me, it was a shock, but because I remember what I, my life purpose was, I could make it. I could learn, I could grow from there. I encountered different kinds of discrimination now, not so much against my gender, which was also part of the issue, but also against my color, about my immigration status, about my size, about my, my language skills. So I understood what it means to be discriminated against. I understood how it meant to be an other. But with my purpose, I could move forward. Because your life purpose is the north point of your personal compass. It is also, the life, the life purpose is also the way you drive your business, your company, and your whole world. It allows you to navigate your goals from wherever you are and help you adjust and leverage your changing environment. I remember this when I went start working. I remember this when I was at Nike and I was looking at this young Puerto Rican girl who had just graduated from design school. She was so new to this country she didn't drive, and she was definitely afraid of coming to the West Coast because we had all the space, and she didn't know how to get around. We helped her figure out the bus system. She joined the company, and the first Michael Jordan design line was a product of her work. So we believed in somebody who looked like on the outside may have had a lot of handicap, language skills, not the same, even though it's English, it's not the same language in a way. Familiarity with the country, very different. And of course, all the different challenges, somebody would come from another country with very little knowledge. But we gain so much when we take the step to say, I can see you pass the outer trappings. I can see your potential. We can make a difference together. Rosa Lopez has gone on to do many wonderful things. And Rosa Lopez has also helped Nike establish a $700 million basketball division into a multi-billion dollar business now. And that is what we can do when we em em embrace diversity. You already know something about my background, so I won't go into it much more. But they didn't stop, even though after I became a Fortune 500 CEO, people would ask me, they come up with seemingly innocent questions like, where did you go to school? What do your parents do? A lot of little questions that are very subtle, but they were really asking, how can you, a little immigrant Chinese woman, become this? So I decided to write a book, how to use what you get to get what you want to share with others so that others can learn how they too can use what they have inside and what their life purpose is to achieve the life they want. And thankfully for me, it's now been translated in many languages. So I feel like in a way, I'm being able to give back in a bigger way than I could have otherwise. I even got my face on a Greek postage stamp for my work in both business and humanitarian work. I'm sharing this with you because 
even a little immigrant girl who was told by her own family that she's worthless can make a difference in the world if somebody would give her a chance. Not to say I didn't have a lot of setbacks, denied housing, denied employment, denied even being able to eat in a Denny's. <laughs> but knowing that somebody believes in me, and you can all use the same thing to believe in somebody, can make such a difference in their lives too. Being in movies, but most of all, I never forgot my background. I went back and did work around labor standards in all the countries we worked with. And we worked in 120 countries. We only produced in about 40 countries. But in those 40 countries, we changed labor standards, established higher labor standards, working conditions, lighting conditions, ventilation, all these things. And that's really what made me feel happy and proud that I've been able to make a difference in these things. Now I go back, I work in, in with vitamin angels, supplying supplements, particularly vitamin A for children that may not have that. As you know, the cognitive processes don't develop properly if we don't have enough vitamins when a child is young. And I also work with SCORE, which is the SBA nonprofit arm to outreach and help entrepreneurial businesses, startups from one person on up for free so that we can help make a difference in the world. But what does this mean for you? It's a balancing act. You have a lot to do in your life. You have the balance your work, your home, and your general life. We have to incorporate all that we believe into what we do. And that means in every aspect, remember our life purpose. And how does that in, in integrate it? So that it is not work, home, life separate. It's all a dynamic balance. Because our life purpose guides you. Ask yourself, what makes you feel happy and at peace? What makes you feel fulfilled? What would you like to be remembered for? Is your work fulfilling your life purpose? And what are you doing to give back? We are all very privileged here. What are we doing to give back? Are we sharing? Are we turning back and lifting our hand out and reaching and helping somebody else who may not have as much as we have now? So we have to define our mission and purpose, research it and make it actionable, determine the steps needed to achieve it, follow through, and keep assessing the course along the way. I want to quote somebody who understands this, the power and flexibility we're talking about here. When you're inspired by some great new purpose, you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you have ever dreamed yourself to be. And this was spoken by the founder of yoga, somebody who understands power and flexibility. And that's what we have, power and flexibility. So what I want you to use this picture is to remind you is, what do you see, a rabbit or a duck? How many people see a rabbit? How many people see a, a duck? More ducks than rabbits? How many people see both? Smart group here. If you, whoops, sorry. If you don't see it, the duck is this way, the rabbit's the other way. Got it? But that's just a graphic image way to remember. It's not either or, it's both. We embrace our life and we share and we do the best we can on all aspects. So how to drive diversity? Commit to the goal. Your organization has definitely done that. Broaden your focus. Whatever your, your focus, whether it's your individual business, your community, ex keep expanding it. And discard stereotyping. Whenever we stereotype anybody, we are hiding or putting a barrier between the person and us. We're not able to see 
who they really are then. Expand our outreach. Form both formal and informal networks in your community. Your community can be your individual practice. It can be your, your community as, as in your town, your city. And it can also be in your network, your formal business network, as well as all your other social networks. In there, you can know different ways of integrating the diversity that is available to help you too. Observe, listen, be patient, and be persistent. Get to be a, get to be a mentor. Offer to be mentored. In that, you can learn and grow, as well as teach and share. And also, never forget that all of this is supposed to be fun. And in learning and growing, you will have fun. So let's talk about cultural reference points. Language, we may all be speaking English, but how we th think about time, how we refer to gender, and how formal and formal we are differs very much by our background and our culture. That's something for us to be a, pay attention to because we always think that our world is the center of this universe. Ours is not. Ours is just another perspective. So for us to recognize that and expand that thinking, we can really hear and learn from there. Food and drink, who we eat with, how we eat, what we eat, when we eat, also changes depending on who we are. In, one of the, in a lot of the cultures I work with, you don't start business before you've had tea. You don't start really talking about business until you've had dinner or at least a meal together. You don't start business until you've talked about your family, you talked about your community. Because what they're trying to do is establish who you are. Who are you really? Not your title, not your expertise, not your reputation. Who are you? And sometimes we forget that. I know when I first went to work in Japan, and being a Chinese American woman is already confusing <laughs> for them. I was so Americanized that I forgot that maybe I need to give them the grace to understand who I am instead of asking for the bottom line. It's a very American thing for us to say, let's get to the bottom line. Many cultures do not think of getting to the bottom line before they understand who we are. So that's the sort of thing we have to think about. What, how do we get to do that? The cultural traditions that we're talking about. Spiritual beliefs. How does that impart your business? In Bhutan, where I've worked, I discovered that you never touch anybody in the top of the head. So a lot of times, we like see a, uh, a cute little child and we want to pat them on the head, top of the head. That's a definite no-no. It's an insult because that's where they believe spirit comes through. And for us to touch it, that's a big insult. So we have to learn and understand the cultures before we go from there. Personal space, how close do you stand to another person? Do you hug them the first time you meet them? Or do you shake hands? Or do you just bow? All these are things that we learn when we understand that our culture is just another one of many. And then to embrace that, we learn and grow from there. Interpersonal communication, I, speech, contact, physical contact, all that is what we're talking about. I want to just tell you a story about when I was working in Korea. I was quite young in my, in my tenure. I was going to Korea because they had messed up on 60,000 dozen genes. That's a lot of genes to mess up on. So I flew there to work, out this, to work out a solution, spending an hour with 17 Korean men in this smoke-filled room, laying out charts and numbers of why and how we can make a difference. At the end of the time, I said, any questions? Mr. Park in the back of the room, the head guy, raises his hand and he says, yes, are you single? And how old are you? My American re reaction would be to say, none of your business, and probably other, some other choice words. Because after all, they screwed up, right? I'm right. 
But understanding I'm dealing with another culture, understanding that I'm here to make a collaboration, I took a deep breath and I said, thank you very much for your concern for my well-being. We can talk about that later, but right now we have an issue. And the issue is how to solve this 60,000 dozen problem we have. In the end, we came to a solution and later, without the whole, his whole team with him, I pulled him aside and explained to him that I was very uncomfortable with what he said and how can we come to a place where we can understand each other as professionals, understanding that he is not used to working with women, especially one that's Asian, who's supposed to be American, and small and young. So understanding that Mr. Park and I are still friends after all these years, because we establish a new understanding, we establish a new respect that truly that we both have a point of view that may have validity in our own perspective. So that's really what we gain, gain, and also a much deeper level of working and collaboration. So the new lessons I learned, I'm not limited by my immediate circumstances. Aligned with my life purpose, I can accomplish what I really want. Living by my principles, I can achieve success in business and life. And I have the privilege to share my lessons with others. So, what have you learned? What have you learned? How can you give back? How can you share? How can you use diversity to increase the meaning in your life, the meaning in your practice, the meaning in the world? I'm not saying it's easy. Because what you do is so important, and it's really literally a matter of life and death, Sometimes we do get out of balance, and I did that a few years ago myself. And so I wrote another book called Living the Life of Your Dreams, and that is about living a life so that we have a dynamic balance. When we remember our life purpose, it doesn't mean that we have to focus uniquely on one thing. We have to remember the life balance we talked about earlier, life, work, home. And that's what we talked about here. So I don't have time today to go into the principles that we have that I want to share you. There are four simple principles that I live my life that have been very successful both in my life and my work. If you text me your name and email address, I'll send you the principles. And it's, of course, free. Don't write me a note on this text number because that's all it can do. It just sends you that. If you want to send me a note, please send it to Marilyn at MarilynTam.com and I'll be happy to respond. But if you text me that, I'll get a chance to send you the, the, the deeper information and uh, the, uh, the details we couldn't cover today. But now I have one more gift for you. And this gift that we're gonna to share together. This word is Thai, I wrote it myself. Now, the gift is that I'm gonna ask you all to stand up. Doesn't hurt, I promise. Thai is a Chinese word, and it means great. If you know anything about Chinese, it's a pictorial language. It's made up of all the pieces. If you just look at the line that goes up from top to bottom this way, and this and the one that goes the other way, those two lines by themselves means human. When you add the line that goes across the top, the word is now big. When we add the dot in the middle, the word is now great. So why did I get you to stand up? Because we're gonna dance this together and I'll explain to you why. It's not scary. Just stand comfortably. Okay, just take it one hand, it doesn't matter which one, just bring one hand up. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring the greatest force in the universe that you know. God, Jesus, Allah, Mohammed, Krishna, Buddha, whatever. Bring that force, nature, bring that force into your body and ground it on one side. Now use your other hand, do the same thing. Bring that force, the most powerful force you know, and bring it and ground it onto the other side. When you ground your biggest power to the earth, where you stand, you are now human. So welcome, human beings. Now, when we open our arms out, and we embrace this whole 
wonderful world and all the diversity in it, you're now big. And only when you come from the deepest part of you, from what is really calling to you and you're given from there, are you only great. Okay, can we do it one more time? <laughs> Bring the greatest force of the universe for you into your body and ground it into the earth. Start from the other side. Bring it again. Down. Hello, human beings. Embrace the diversity and share from there and give from your highest purpose back to the world. Thank you.